Welcome to another Databases. Today we're going to be talking about query evaluation. Now this uh, topic is of particular interest, or should be of particular interest to you, uh, since it pretty much is uh, project one. Um, today, my goal today is basically twofold. Uh, first, to, to give you guys a sense of uh, how database systems, how database systems evaluate queries in general. Uh, but also, I'll be trying to tie this back uh, to project one. And pretty much throughout the entire uh, lecture, I'll be pointing out, and this is how the reference implementation does it. Um, that's basically meant to be sort of the, uh, the baseline approach. And if you follow the, this baseline approach, uh, the grading scripts are basically set up in such a way that there's a really good chance you'll get a B plus or better. All right, uh, so that said, um, speaking of project one, uh, as of tonight, you should actually be able to hit the submit button, uh, engage the tester. Uh, as before, you'll be able to submit as many times as you like uh, up to the deadline. Uh, if you would like a better grade than what you got, uh, feel free to submit again. Uh, a number of example data, data sets and queries have been posted already. Uh, those are basically going, if you succeed, if you successfully process those data sets and queries, then you should be reasonably successful uh, at processing the overall, uh, the, the workload that the test grader uh, is going to subject your, your code to. Um, and just a quick reminder, uh, the grades, assuming you produce correct results, uh, your grades are basically going to be based on the uh, performance of your code. So. Uh, if you use an algorithm that is orders of magnitude, uh, that has orders of magnitude worse performance, you will receive an orders of magnitude worse grade uh, than the reference implementation. Uh, one last thing, I've emailed out a round of baked goods tokens already. Uh, I, I encourage people to participate in discussions on Piazza. Uh, there's already a, sort of a fair amount of questions being posted, uh, but I'd like to see a little more uh, discussion of various subjects uh, related to the uh, various um, sort of uh, questions that I posed during the, uh, the lectures. So um, I'd like to see more of those, and more baked goods tokens will be awarded uh, over the coming uh, weeks and months. All right, so uh, because this lecture is in part about the project, I'd like to start out uh, by giving you some idea of what to expect from the auto grader. Uh, so the auto grader, is, you can think of it as just someone sitting at a command line, uh, basically sitting down and typing in uh, execute, yeah, uh, execute the following Java code. Um, people, yeah. uh, execute the following Java code. A um, couple of things to note about that. The first is that all of, uh, before any of this gets run, we'll be compiling your code. And as before, we're basically going to be looking for a directory in your Git repository at the root of your Git repository called source. We'll be finding all of the Java files that are located in there, and we'll be compiling all of them in one go. Uh, this should be as general as pretty much any build system uh, that you would care to use with this uh, Eclipse, Ant, Make, whatever you feel like. Um, that'll get compiled to build directory, which will then be put into the class path. Um, we'll be, as before, executing edu.buffalo.csc562.main uh, edu and uh, passing it a couple of different arguments. Uh, the first argument is a data directory, so dash dash data and then a path, and that path will uh, include a directory full of uh, files, file name dot dat, and each of those files is essentially a CSV file, uh, one uh, one record per line and one attribute per comma separated field. Uh, except instead of commas, we're using vertical pipes, uh, the vertical pipe character. Uh, right. The second set of arguments that you'll get are a set of uh, SQL files, which will contain uh, one or more create table statements and one or more select statements. Uh, your 
goal is to take all of those select statements and evaluate them. Uh, you'll note that we're not passing you any insert, copy, or uh, load statements. All of, your, uh, all of the data for the tables that get created should be taken from uh, the files in the data directory. Uh, and the last thing is, well, there are going to be one or more select statements in that query, uh, in those files. Your goal is then to evaluate each of those select statements and print the output. Again, pipe delimited one record per line. Any questions up to this point? Any questions on the interface? Yes. That's correct. Anything else? Uh, the question was, are there just create table and select statements? That uh, there are no other statements. Uh, the only types of statements that you will get are create table and select, at least until checkpoint, the optional checkpoint four. Yes, in the back. When we print out the records, you don't want like a header or any kind of No header. header. Uh, the question was, do you uh, print out any header information? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, just the records uh, in the attribute order that is specified in the SQL query. Any other questions? Uh, speak up. Uh, the, I believe the answer is no. Um, all of the queries that you'll be subjected to are now posted on Piazza as part of the, uh, the data packet. So, uh, as, like I said, if you, if you successfully evaluate those queries, then um, that is sufficient for checkpoint one. Uh, keep in mind, though, that checkpoint two will be subjecting you to a substantially uh, harder workload so the more you do now, uh, the easier checkpoint two is going to be. Or the more functionality you implement at this stage, uh, the easier checkpoint two is going to be. Anything else? Is that a hint? No. All right. So um, this is the interface we'll be expecting. And uh, now I'm going to talk basically about how a database system evaluates queries in general. Um, so, as those of you who have uh, started exploring JSQL parser may have noticed, SQL is an incredibly, incredibly messy language. Um, it's really nice for humans. There's a lot of syntactic sugar. Uh, it's very nice to, uh, there's a lot of different options for uh, ways to express yourself. Uh, but at the same time, this, uh, this generality, this, this syntactic sugar, makes it very hard uh, to evaluate directly. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, uh, syntactic sugar is basically extra functionality that uh, increases the readability of your code, uh, but doesn't necessarily uh, increase the complexity, doesn't, incre doesn't give you additional power. Um, as an example, uh, where and having, uh, both of those essentially map to selection predicates, as we'll uh, discuss later. Um, Neither of those adds additional power to your query language, uh, but having those two allows you to make much more readable uh, queries under certain uh, conditions. So because of this syntactic sugar, uh, and or in addition to or even because of this syntactic sugar, this leads to a lot of different corner cases that an evaluator would have to handle. Uh, to give you an example, uh, if I have a select state uh, as my target clause A and B, that's going to involve a very different uh, evaluation code path than uh, if I have a select statement A sum B. In the first case, I can do, uh, I can iterate over every row of my input and produce a single output. In the second case, I actually have to compute an aggregate. There's a lot more uh, complexity involved uh, in evaluating the second expression. And what's worse is that identifying which of those code paths to use involves some fairly deep introspection into the expressions uh, 
uh, that you're going to be evaluating. And that's not something you want to have to do at runtime. So the, the basic takeaway from this is that SQL, while it's a nice language for humans to write in, is not something you want to be evaluating directly. You don't want to have uh, an evaluator that directly processes uh, over SQL. Now, we talked two weeks ago about uh, another relational query language called relational algebra. Now, this is equivalent to SQL. Anything that you can express in relational algebra, or at least a slightly extended form of relational algebra, uh, you can just as easily express in uh, SQL and vice versa. You can uh, take SQL and you can map it down to a slightly extended form of relational algebra. Um, but that said, relational algebra is much simpler. Uh, there's only a handful of operators that you have to deal with, and there's no duplication of effort. Um, you don't have to take a piece of code and copy-paste it all over, uh, all over the place, because the functionality uh, is, uh, that, that you're working with is going to be pretty isolated. Um, it's also, uh, in a sense, non-declarative. A um, relational algebra expression has uh, a very precise uh, eva natural evaluation order. Uh, given one of these expressions, it's fairly clear how to evaluate that, uh, what kind of process you'd have to go through, uh, or at least the ordering of the process that you'd have to go through uh, to evaluate it. Um, I use non-declarative in, in quotation marks, mainly because uh, the semantics of a relational algebra expression are also very well defined, making it very easy to rewrite uh, into a different form. And, of course, everything is, uh, has very little syntactic sugar. So, long story short, relational algebra is a much nicer thing to try and evaluate. And one of the poor things I'm going to try and get across, uh, the, the two main things I'm going to try and get across in today's lecture are, number one, how do you take a relational algebra expression and evaluate it? And number two, how do you take a SQL expression and map it to its equivalent relational algebra expression? So any questions before I begin? Great. All right, so as before, uh, just to recap, there are uh, a handful of different relational algebra expressions. Uh, selection, projection, uh, depending on how you look at it, either cross product or join. Uh, union, uh, basic relation, uh, the relations themselves you can kind of think of uh, as an operator as well. Uh, we talked about minus uh, as, as an operator. Very few SQL uh, implementations actually treat minus uh, as a first class citizen. So we're actually going to kind of push that to the background for now. Ignore it. Uh, so those, those core operations form pretty much the basis for all of the things that you can do with SQL. Uh, we haven't talked about aggregation. And while there's no explicit aggregation operator in, in sort of the canonical relational algebra, uh, today we're going to talk about a slightly extended form of relational algebra that includes uh, aggregates, as well as operations that are only meaningful over lists. So if you recall, uh, relational operate, uh, algebra operates over what? Sets, yes. Um, relational algebra operates over sets. Uh, SQL operates over bags. And so I'm going to make that distinction uh, fairly clear. These relational algebra operators we're going to be talking about today focus predominantly on bags or lists in the case of the latter two operators sort and limit. Now, I'll occasionally use the word query plan interchangeably with relational algebra expression, because those, uh, what a relational algebra expression is, uh, is sort of a plan. It uh, tells you how you're going to evaluate a particular expression. Now, let me give you an example of that. Uh, here I have a, a SQL query and, a, and an equivalent uh, relational algebra expression. 
Uh, so give me all of the officer, the first name of every officer on the USS Enterprise. Um, and the equivalent SQL expression, I'm going, to, uh, sorry, the uh, equivalent relational algebra expression is going to be to uh, select all of the ships where the name is Enterprise, join that on ship and ID with officers, and then uh, project out the first name uh, attribute. Are there any, uh, is there any confusion about this mapping? Everyone buy that it's equivalent? All right, uh, I'm gonna assume that you're not falling into a coma and carry on here. Um, so we have this relational algebra expression and we want, uh, this sort of gives us a very intuitive way of talking about the data flow, how the data gets moved around. Uh, and you can visualize this as a tr not just a flat expression, but actually a tree. Uh, so the, the first step in that process, I'd like to pick out all of the ships whose name is Enterprise. Well, I can express that as I'm reading from the ship's relation and I'm picking out those ships whose name is Enterprise. Then I can take the join and in the same way, I can talk about the join as reading from two different data sources, namely the output of that, that first part of the query uh, as well as the officer's relation. And then the last step, project down to the first name. So if you look at this, this kind of uh, very neatly captures the, the computation process. Uh, I have my two inputs, and there's this sort of conceptual data flow that goes up the tree all the way to the output, which represents the relation that the query describes. So uh, does everyone buy that this kind of captures the computation? Any questions on, on this so far? Yes. Why, uh, why represent it as a tree? Um, so the, the question is, why, why do we represent this as, as a tree? Uh, the main reason is tree may be slightly uh, too strong a term. Uh, the, uh, the point of this is to capture how the information uh, flows through the query to uh, create a, a sort of um, representation of, of how, the, the inform, uh, how data needs to get processed. And in this case, or in other words, a, a sort of dependency graph. Um, if you'd prefer to use the word DAG, directed acyclic graph, that's equivalent. Uh, that would be an equivalent way of, of talking about this. But uh, so, in this case, the, the output, what we're presenting to the user, depends on the result of that projection. The projection depends on the result of the join. The join depends on the officer's relation uh, and the output of the selection predicate and so forth. Um, and another way to look at that is that there's sort of this push. Uh, information is flowing out of the officer's relation, uh, sorry, out of the ship's relation into the selection predicate, out of the selection predicate and out of the officer's relation into the join so you can either look at this as sort of uh, pulling information up through the tree or pushing information down through the tree. Either way, it's a very convenient visualization for that kind of information flow model. Does that ad address your concern? Uh, yes, so typically, uh, yes, there will be more than one child typically. Uh, generally only two, but let me get to the, uh, I'll get in, into that a little more deeply as we get on in the lecture. All right, uh, so my general outline for today is going to be, uh, is going to be as, so, as such. Uh, first, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, evaluating relational algebra. So that's pretty much the end goal here. We have uh, given a relational algebra expression, we've, uh, I'm claiming at least, that these are relatively easy to evaluate. Um, so by the end of uh, the first part, we're going to sort of have uh, a basis for evaluating relational algebra expressions. Uh, 
the second part of the lecture is going to be uh, focused on taking SQL expressions and converting them into relational algebra expressions. This is a not an entirely straightforward mapping, but hopefully uh, should be relatively conceptually simple. Uh, and the last thing I, I'm going to very briefly mention uh, this notion of logical versus physical plans and uh, give you a little bit of advice on how to write your code in such a way uh, that it will make your life in checkpoint two a little bit easier. So, all right. Um, now, the core idea of uh, relational operators, uh, the core idea of relational algebra as uh, an evaluation primitive is that you can isolate computation into these little nuggets. Um, a join implementation, a join, uh, given two different relations, I can implement a join fairly efficiently. Um, I read from this relation, scan, uh, well, we'll talk about how that happens in a moment, but I can talk about a join over two inputs as reading from two inputs and writing to one output. It's a very, very easy way to isolate computation. And so I'm going to start from a really high level. If I have a set of these isolated units of computation, how do I connect them all together? So to make that, uh, to illustrate that, I'm going to focus on this join operator. Um, If I, if I can take this, uh, this one join operator, I can write some general code that implements uh, that join for just uh, two inputs, one output. Come on in. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, some of the people, ghosts or something? Aliens now ghosts, all right. Uh, so basically the, the way we want, to be, we want to look at these operators is as sort of isolated, isolated units of processing that read from one or more inputs and produce uh, one output. And there's a couple of different ways that we can uh, look at this model. Uh, they actually map to the two different views of, uh, of the trees that I was uh, describing earlier. Now the, the first of these is to treat each operator as a step, in the an entire step in the computation pipeline. Um, this join, for example, reads from two different inputs. Now in one particular model, uh, what I do is first I compute the entirety of those inputs, and then to compute the join, I read from those pre-computed inputs. So I can buffer all of, the, uh, all of the outputs that are produced by the input operators, and then run my whole computation, uh, read a bunch of stuff from my inputs, and then little by little uh, produce outputs, which once again get buffered, saved, and uh, passed in to the next input. Make that precise. I have, uh, for every operator, I allocate an output buffer, and one operator gets executed at any given time. It consumes inputs from its, from its input buffer, and it produces outputs in its output buffer. Now, uh, question to you guys, does this make sense? Is this an efficient way of, uh, of processing data? Uh, I heard a no. Uh, there is one drawback, which is that the uh, if you're buffering all of the output, you won't be able to start one computation 
until the prior computation is completed. Any other comments? Yes. So uh, a second, so the second comment is that if we have two different, um, two different independent operators, we could potentially execute those two operators in parallel and get better performance. That's completely right. And um, in fact, my model two. Uh, so one, one other observation that uh, one might have about this is, so databases are used to dealing with very large amounts of data. What happens when these, uh, these buffers are going to get really, really big, um, which means we need to start resorting to disk. Now, if you took away nothing from last Wednesday's lecture uh, but this, take away that you don't want to go to disk if you can avoid it. Um, this, this particular model is great until you actually have to start writing things to disk. And if any of you are familiar with Hadoop or MapReduce, um, this is one of the main reasons why uh, its performance is so bad, because every single stage, things get flushed to disk. So one slightly simpler approach to this is to parallelize it, to have uh, keep the buffers in between the various uh, operators, but then cap the sizes of these buffers buffers and have all of them operating in parallel, have one thread uh, consuming inputs from uh, the buffers as they get produced and producing outputs into its own buffer. Now what about this? Is this uh, efficient? Benefit, uh, what's, uh, what might be a benefit or what might be a drawback of using this approach? Okay, so if the buffer is big enough to, uh, if one of the operators needs to read more than fits into a buffer, you might end up with a deadlock situation. Uh, that is technically correct. Um, all of the algorithms that I'll be describing today, uh, gener actually no, you're, you're completely right. Um, the, you may end up with a deadlock situation in some, uh, in some corner cases, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is quite doable. It's actually quite efficient, um, but it's very hard to get right because uh, it requires very careful synchronization. Um, also, uh, relatedly, the deadlock. Um, getting these, uh, Getting the, this particular approach to um, implement it correctly can be rather difficult, which is why the reference implementation uses a slightly different approach. Um, and this approach is fairly typical in most database systems. Um, so going back to our, our basic picture, we have an operator. Uh, it produces an output. It pr uh, reads from a set of inputs. Um, another way to implement these operators is to use a pull-based model. So if I, uh, if I receive a request for the next tuple uh, from my output, um, my, the operator code is going to send a request to its inputs, uh, send a request to one input, send a request to another input, and basically keep sending requests uh, to all of its inputs until it has enough state uh, read internally to be able to produce one output. In the case, for example, of a, a selection predicate, I could, well, get to it in a moment. Um, so the idea here is that you implement a uh, iterator interface, uh, an iterator interface, 
basically every operator implements is implemented as precisely one function, generate tuple. And the operator has access to all of its inputs, and every time read tuple is called, you read however many input tuples you need to read, you do whatever processing you need to do, and then you return exactly one tuple. Now, is this, this approach uses the least amount of work possible to generate one tuple in general, but it, is it always possible to use this? Well, the short answer is that read tuple, um, there are certain classes of operators that we'll discuss today uh, where this is actually not possible. Um, so what the, uh, what the reference implementation, implementation does is combines this with the previous model. Um, it, every single operator implements this, uh, pu this pull interface, this iterator interface, uh, but certain classes of operators uh, as we'll discuss later on, uh, namely aggregate, join, sort, and distinct, uh, get, sort of are implemented with internal buffers. Uh, and whenever the first time, sorry, the first time that uh, read next tuple is called, they essentially do all of the computation that they're ever going to do and create a buffer of all of their outputs. Whereas for the operators that actually do admit this kind of pull-based interface natively, um, they actually implement those, uh, those uh, correctly. All right. So let's get into the actual implementation of the operators. Selection is probably one of the simplest. Um, it gets a stream of input tuples and any tuple that uh, passes the selection criteria uh, gets passed back. Um, when, I re when I write read next tuple, I, uh, the selection predicate calls read next tuple on its input. If that tuple that gets returned from its input uh, meets the selection uh, predicate, it returns it. Otherwise, it tries again, and it keeps trying until it finds one that matches. Um, this is effectively the reference implementation, uh, the, the, the approach that the reference implementation takes. Um, any questions on this? All right. There's a, a slight variant of this, which may make sense in some cases, which is to actually take all of the uh, the inputs and first sort them and then use a binary search over the materialized inputs to find the tuple that you're looking for. Now, sorting is generally a very expensive operation, so this is not usually something that you want to do. Um, but it often makes sense if the inputs are already sorted. That is to say, if you don't need to sort the, the inputs, if they're already sorted, um, binary search can be considerably more efficient. Um, but, yeah. but this is a fairly circumstantial uh, process. All right. Um, and this is, not, uh, this is not how the reference implementation uh, solves the problem. All right, so the next, uh, d any questions on the selection operator? So projection is uh, also fairly straightforward, probably even more straightforward than, uh, than selection. As uh, tuples arrive, get, get rid of the, the fields that aren't relevant and output new tuples that contain only the fields that you're interested in. Um, now, I call this the naive uh, solution, because typically when uh, we talk about relational algebra projection, we're talking about uh, bag projection. Uh, does this approach work for set projection? Uh, 
you guys really are in a coma. Um, I'm going to... All right. Does this approach work for bag projection, uh, for set projection? I heard a no. Do you care to justify that? In the back, yes. Uh, could you speak up a little? If, if it's already in there and you're trying to add it again, you don't want to add something. You can only have one. Use. So you're not actually adding anything in this case. You're getting rid of certain problems. Okay. So, but you're on the right track. Yes. Right. So. Um, get rid of certain attributes, uh, those attributes might have been the distinguishing attributes uh, for certain tuples. So if I have James Kirk and James Joyce, and then I get rid of the, uh, the first, sorry, the second column, the, the last name, I end up with two copies of James. This doesn't work for, uh, for sets because by projecting certain columns away, you might end up with uh, duplicate values. However, since SQL uses bags, this is uh, the reference implementations approach. All right, um, next operator, sort. Uh, this is really one that's uh, very tricky to implement correctly. Um, the reference implementation for checkpoint one just does this in probably the most boneheaded way possible. Uh, read in the entire input stream, Use one of the native Java sort methods. Congratulations, you now have a sorted array of tuples. Output them one at a time in order. Any questions on this? Uh, on Wednesday, we'll talk about a slightly more intelligent way of doing this uh, that'll be better suited for project two and will actually be uh, necessary, necessary for checkpoint two. But for checkpoint one, that's, uh, that's pretty much the best way to do it. What kind of problems could we run into, by the way, with uh, that approach? Uh, so what if, uh, does anyone see an immediate problem with this? If it, yeah, so if the data gets really, really big, you can't materialize it in memory, and uh, this approach just fails completely. You'll uh, crash Java, um, but will not be feeding you any. Uh, the reference implementation easily stays well within the, the memory limits on the data sizes we're giving you for this. All right. Um, you can also use this approach uh, to implement distinct. Um, as before, sort all of the inputs. And now once they're sorted, you can just uh, pull them out in order. Um, anytime you see two inputs, two successive inputs that are the same, you drop the all but the first. Um, And because they're sorted, you're guaranteed that all of the identical values are, uh, are adjacent. So more practically, um, when you're implementing this, it makes sense to have uh, a separate sort operator and a separate deduplication operator, just so you can reuse code a bit more efficiently. Any questions so far? All right, and once again, this is basically the reference implementation, how the refer reference implementation does it. Um, all right, we're running a little, oh, I'm not gonna go into, uh, I'm not gonna duplicate that. Okay, so, uh, Probably the, the one interesting uh, piece of code that will be required to write for this 
uh, is a nested loop join. Um, no, sorry, is, is the join operator, or the one main interesting piece of code. Uh, the, the sort of most primitive way of implementing a join is to do the cross product with a selection. Um, and this is basically just a nested loop, which is why it's called a nested loop join. Um, where every tuple in one relation scan over every tuple of the other relation and emit all possible pairs. Um, Tuple one, scan, tuple two, scan, tuple three, scan, rinse, repeat, until you get to the end of A, and now you've produced the full cross product of everything. Um, this is not necessarily the most efficient way, but it's guaranteed to be correct. Um, and it's guaranteed to be universal. So. Uh, for every single possible uh, join operation, you can implement it in uh, this way. This is the approach taken by the reference implementation for uh, checkpoint one. Uh, please note that this is not the implementation taken uh, in checkpoint. This will not be the implementation uh, taken approach taken in checkpoint two. So, uh, if most of your code is going to be living here. Uh, if you want to get started on checkpoint two, this is a place uh, that I would advise looking up. Any questions on joins so far? All right. So if you want to do something slightly more efficient, uh, there's what's called the block nested loop join. Now this approach takes into account the fact that you do actually have a little bit of memory to play with. Um, so what'll happen is that you take, uh, in a block nested loop, you take the basic set of tuples that you're working with and you partition them into chunks. One chunk being however much will fit in memory. The, then for every pair of blocks, do the, the pairing just as you would the nested loop join itself. Uh, for every pair of blocks, you perform a nested loop join uh, just internally. Now, by, by doing this partitioning, you can kind of read the tuples into the join operator, which means that any processing required to produce the, the tuples uh, to begin with, you don't have to repeat that. Um, if the, the input tuples are on disk, um, Wherever they're coming from, this will produce a much more, uh, this will tend to be much more uh, efficient because you're only reading from, uh, from the inputs once per block uh, rather than once per tuple. Any questions on this? Yes. Uh, how is this more efficient for the um, so this is more efficient. The distinction is that this approach uh, advocates buffering a small amount of tuples within the join operator itself. So you might implement this by, uh, if I was writing read next tuple, for uh, the regular nested loop join, I would basically keep two pointers, on, uh, two iterator uh, pointers uh, for, for my input screens. Anytime I read a tuple, I uh, read the next tuple from iterator one, uh, from one of my iterators. I join it with the last tuple that I read from the other iterator. That's that's my output. Um, and every time I get another tuple, I read another tuple from one input stream and keep producing outputs that way. When I reach the end of the input stream, I reset it to the beginning, move on to the next tuple in the, in the second stream. Now, depending on, uh, depending on how complex reading those tuples in, from the input stream is, uh, or, sorry, one, one thing to note, 
from that is that you're scanning the entire input stream once for every, tup, uh, for every tuple in the other input stream. And if that scan is expensive, that's going to slow you down considerably. Uh, the way the reference implementation does this is it actually re um, it keeps nothing in memory. Uh, it reads the entire uh, input stream one uh, from disk one, to, uh, one row at a time. Now, by buffering a small chunk of that, you can save yourself the expense of continually iterating over uh, over that input stream. Not necessarily. Um, if the disk head stays in the same position, you're still scanning over each of the input streams. So, so you're still essentially doing the same exact thing. Um, only you're reading this entire chunk of um, A to memory. You're reading this entire chunk of into memory. Lights. Reading this entire chunk of A into memory, this entire chunk of B into memory. You're doing that joint. Now this is head for B is here. It's already ready to read in the next batch. I can get rid of this in memory, and then read this back into memory, and I compute that joint. And you get rid of that, read the next thing in, compute the next joint in order. So I've done a full scan of B, no seeks, just a regular scan. But after one full scan of B, now I've computed the joint against this entire chunk of A, rather than just one tuple of A. When I move on to the next block of A, yes, I do need to seek back to the beginning of B. But I only need to do that once for each block of A, rather than once for each tuple of A. Does that address your question? In the back? Are you saying like the connector, does this imply that the connector for uh, going from one operator to the other operator, the output is going to a file and the input reads that file? So every time you're reading and writing from a file? No, so the reference implementation uses the iterator interface. Um, every, time I, every time I read a tuple, Every time I need an input tuple from one operator, I call read one tuple on that operator, and I get and I get back a tuple. Um, the point here is that the file, um, what's going on? So, as a simple example, very simple plan. Uh, you the cross product of A and B where A and B are files. And in this, in this particular example, uh, so the way the reference implementation works is uh, when I reset to the beginning of the stream, and the stream is already a file, that reset basically takes, seeks to the beginning of the file and restarts scanning through the entire file. This is, this is intentionally sub up, but um, But it's uh, all the erasers. Um, if I had a selection for the computer, I still have to reset to the beginning of this operator's screen. I still have to reset to the beginning of this operator's screen. But 
assuming that this operator wasn't buffering any outputs, it would, in order to reset its screen, it would have to reset this operator's screen as well. So the, the join operator or the cross product operator has to repeatedly scan over uh, at least one of its inputs. It has to repeatedly reset uh, its one of its inputs. Now, one way to improve upon the reference implementation would be to add buffering somewhere in this pipeline. Whether that's the file scan operator uh, prefetches a uh, sequence of couples, or the join operator has an inter keeps an internal buffer. Um, both of those are legitimate ways to improve on the reference implementation of performance. Does that address your concern? Yeah. Any other questions so far? All right. Um, one other question that, came, that comes up here uh, is outer joins. Um, checkpoint one, you're not expected to support outer joins. Checkpoint two, you will be uh, expected to add support for outer joins. Um, this is over the nested loop join. This is actually a very trivial thing to implement. Um, a couple of other uh, join algorithms that we'll be talking about on Wednesday. Uh, this is also relatively easy to implement. Outer joins are also relatively easy to implement. So I would suggest uh, considering at the very least how you would implement them right now uh, for checkpoint one. Any questions? So um, we've gone over so far how to, uh, given a relational algebra expression, or a, a, one of these query plans in this slightly extended form of relational algebra, we've talked about how to take those plans and actually evaluate them. Um, are there any questions on that before I move on? Yes. does not use buffering. Uh, if you do not use buffering, you're guaranteed you're still going to be able to earn at least AV plus. It would be more adventurous among you uh, to, to actually give an answer to this question. Um, experiment. Try it out. See what happens. Um, I can tell you that Java has the heap size, the default heap size of 1 gigabytes. Um, try it out. Run some experiments. Pick a good buffer size, or try, try one buffer size, see if it works. Try another buffer size. Keep iterating. That's, that's how code development works. Yes? Well, there is no buffer. Uh, like I said, there's, there's no buffering going on at all. Uh, you were responsible for the entire code. Um, you do, uh, admittedly, you don't know how, um, what's, you don't have a precise characterization of the hardware configuration of the testing needs. Um, like I said there, uh, Java has a heap size of one gigabyte. Um, obviously allocating more than one gigabyte worth of buffer is a bad idea. Um, I can tell you that the, uh, the hardware, Typical commercial grade rotary hard disk drives. Um, they have arbitrarily large amounts of space, but for this assignment at least, you don't have uh, the ability to put stuff back on the disk. Um, 
you also don't know the, the characteristics, the precise data size that uh, your code will be subjected to. And this is, this is one of the main questions that uh, database systems have to deal with uh, and grapple with. Uh, at this stage, um, we haven't gone over it enough for me to properly answer your question. Uh, within three to four weeks, we'll be covering optimization, and during those lectures, we'll be, uh, we'll be discussing, among other things, how to do cost estimation. Um, and for checkpoint two, no, sorry, checkpoint three, uh, you will be given the uh, ability to pre-compute. So there will be a pre-computation step where you can gather statistics about the data and use those statistics to more efficiently evaluate uh, your queries. Given those statistics, you can estimate a good buffer size. Um, in the meantime, there are a number of different approaches. I'm mostly going to leave, the, uh, leave it up to you to figure out what those are, mainly because this is an optional portion of, uh, of the assignment. Um, by the way, uh, uh, what I would like to do is after uh, the deadline for assignment one, um, I'll be posting sort of the top performing, um, the top performing teams. Uh, there may be uh, baked goods involved in that as well. More motivation to improve performance. Uh, so to, to answer your question, I'm going to answer your question. Uh, the, the short version is you don't have to do it. The slightly longer version is um, uh, experiment by various things. You can submit multiple times. Uh, so if it works on the test machine, uh, we'll, we may be changing the data characteristics up over the course of the testing process, but um, if it, as long, oh, same scale, but different precise data. Um, so it's basically, you know, uh, I'm leaving this open to you. Challenge for the reader. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? All right, um, so the last thing I wanted to cover in the last uh, couple of minutes here, or the last 20 minutes here, is, uh, okay, so you've got a relational, uh, you've got a way to evaluate relational algebra expressions. What we're giving you is SQL. You, know, you obviously have to be able to translate from one to the other. And well, this is basically the roadmap for that. Um, I'll be getting into these a little more in depth in just a moment, but effectively, you can take a select union query and you can turn it into a uh, very simple relational algebra plan, uh, or some definition of very simple. Um, more precisely, these, these operators, most of these operators are optional and depend on the presence of a particular clause in the SQL statement. So let's actually go over them uh, one by one. So the first, the very base of this is the from clause. Uh, the from clause tells you uh, which tables you need to read from, the inputs. Logical starting point. Um, the simple way to do that is to start with cross products. So if I have select from R, S, R comma, S comma, T, that basically just boils down to R join S, or sorry, R cross product S cross product T. Uh, any questions on this? Yes? 
Uh, so one thing to note about the from clause uh, is that you can also you can have nested queries, but this is actually much easier than it sounds. Uh, a, a select query is is a perfectly reasonable um, input relation, but a, su a, a select query creates this relational query, uh, relational plan. But recall that in relational algebra, every expression defines a relation. Um, that expression, even if that expression is uh, arbitrarily complex. So, assuming you implement this correctly, there should not actually be any distinction uh, between whether you're reading from a nested selection uh, or a relation. Uh, the from clause also has this, uh, gives you the ability to provide um, explicit join conditions. Now, while you're certainly welcome to implement an actual join operator, and we'll be talking about a few of them, uh, as I said, on Wednesday, the easiest way to do this is to just implement that cross product as a selection on top of a cross product. Same thing with outer joins. Um, Without our joins, you can't do the the, uh, the condition actually has to be incorporated into the outer join itself. I'd encourage you to think about how you'd implement this. Once again, it's not actually required for uh, checkpoint one. The, the one probably most interesting uh, case here is when you have a natural join. Um, I, in order to implement a natural join, you'll have to have some way of uh, computing the schema of one of these of one of these relations. Um, given a join between R and S, I'd need the schema of R and the schema of S. So I encourage you to uh, be quite general about how this uh, the piece of code that computes the schema is implemented. Uh, and specifically, I'd encourage you to have a piece of code. Uh, that can compute the schema of any relational algebra operator. Um, is it uh, fairly? Do you follow how uh, natural join would be implemented? Any question or any questions on how natural join might be implemented? All right, any questions on the from clause? All right. So moving on. Uh, the from clause uh, feeds into the, uh, the next step in the pipeline would be the selection predicate, the where clause. Um, this is probably the easiest thing to implement. You have a condition wrap that in a selection operator, type it, done. Um, there's really not much uh, else to say here. You, you just have a, a condition, the selection predicate implements, uh, the selection operator implements that predicate. Um, now aggregates, aggregates are a little more uh, interesting. Um, so there's a couple of different ways of implementing aggregates, or, or sorry, a couple of different uh, structures that you might encounter in queries. So the first of these is pretty much the, the standard case. Um, I have uh, a whole bunch of t uh, selection targets, and all of those targets are aggregates. Well, in that case, I can just create one operator that computes the aggregates, computes each of them in parallel. Easy relatively straightforward. Um, reads in, uh, group by aggregates uh, lead to a little bit more uh, complexity. In the case of a single aggregate, you're basically computing one value. Um, you're reading in from your input, and you're producing one output. Or potentially a row, a single row of outputs. In the case of a group by aggregate, you're going to need to do some sort of um, 
you're going to actually need to, to group things together. Uh, for this reason, it might actually make sense to have two separate operators in your implementation, one implementing group by aggregate uh, and one implementing sort of regular base aggregates. Note that you don't, even in a group by aggregate, you don't necessarily need to have all of the uh, group by columns in your targets. Uh, in this particular example, if I have, uh, I'm grouping by B, but I'm only outputting the sum of A. Uh, what this means effectively is that I'm still computing the groups, but then I'm projecting down to A. Uh, just for generality, you might want to implement this as uh, a separate projection operator sitting on top of a regular group by uh, aggregate operator. The last thing uh, that you might want to consider is that you can have computation sitting on the outside of an aggregate. So this is a perfectly legitimate query to, to consider. Uh, group by B and then add B to the sum of A. The easiest way to implement this uh, is probably to combine it into the projection operator. So once again, the projection operator is basically reading in uh, the output of the group by operator, and you can do any sort of computation you want in the projection. Any question on these cases? Great. Um, one thing that's going to be kind of tricky in this conversion process is going to be figuring out, uh, is going to be extracting that particular piece of computation. Now, we talked about relational algebra expressions as trees. Uh, more generally, if, uh, if, if you've taken a, a PL or a compiler's course, uh, any expression can be uh, expanded into what's called an abstract syntax tree. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the expression type in uh, JSQL par parser's expression type uh, actually does this for you. Um, you basically have a tree of objects, a tree of expression objects. Uh, and in order to implement this class of aggregate properly, you're going to need to have some way of uh, looking at that tree, traversing that tree, and pulling out the aggregate operators themselves. Um, if you're familiar with the visitor pattern, that's a really nice way of doing this. Um, you essentially want to visit the aggregate functions and replace those aggregate functions with um, one way to do it is to replace them with variables. So I can take that, uh, I can take my original AST, my original abstract syntax tree, which is B plus the sum aggregate, and I can replace the sum aggregate with a temporary variable. Then when computing my aggregate, I introduce the result of that uh, aggregate computation uh, I name it using the same name that I uh, that I allocated there, and I actually implement the aggregation operator uh, that feeds into the projection operator and uh, produces the correct effect. Any questions on this? Yes. Bounded by the complexity of the query, but uh, uh, your code shouldn't assume any bounds on the depth of the tree. Does that address your? Question? Assume that you have enough. St like I said, the reference implementation does this. The reference implementation uh, is going nowhere near the memory limits. Uh, and if the, the reference implementation was intentionally designed suboptimally, um, and if that goes nowhere near the stack, uh, sorry, the, the uh, Java's uh, stack limit, you guys should be fine. 
In general, you're basically going to be looking at tens. I mean, the, the depth of this tree is dependent on only on the uh, expression complexity. Uh, and a typical SQL query is not going to be all that complex. Uh, the expression components are not going to be that complex. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? All right. Um, so we talked about the, uh, the aggregates. The second condition, namely the having clause, uh, well, that is exactly the same as the first condition. There's a condition. That's the one thing that the selection operator has to do. Not, not much complexity there. Uh, the target clause. Now, ostensibly, this is exactly the same thing. Um, you take a bunch of columns, you project them down to a smaller set of columns. Uh, there are, however, a couple of uh, nuances here that you need to pay attention to. Uh, the first is that, uh, sorry, the, the one major nuance here is uh, that the select portion can have uh, a star or a table dot star in it. And if that's the case, uh, once again, you're going to need some way of computing the schema of your inputs. If you have that, then it should be fairly easy to figure out which, uh, which variables the star represents. Um, right. Uh, when, you compute these, uh, when you compute these schemas, uh, just as a, a heads up, uh, in order to implement the table.star, uh, you're going to also need to keep, it, keep track of the table alias, uh, or the table name. Uh, right, so basically we've gotten through most of this. Uh, the next step is order by. There's an order by clause, you need a sort operator in there. Uh, if there's a distinct in there, you're going to need a distinct operator. And if there's a limit clause, well, you're going to need a limit operator. Um, nothing fancy here. Uh, you can also have select union select. Uh, if that happens, well, again, very simple. You need a union operator that reads from uh, one stream and then reads from the next. Again, nothing very fancy here. Uh, really, the only complexity that you're going to encounter, the, the majority of the complexity in this translation uh, is going to be involved going to be involved in the aggregate and uh, the target clause. So any questions on this translation? All right. Uh, I encourage you to get started on uh, the relational algebra plans as soon as possible. There's, uh, it looks simple, and in, to some degree it is uh, not especially not all that incredibly difficult, uh, but it's very easy to uh, underestimate the amount of time that it will take you. All right, one last thing I want to cover today, and that's uh, a little bit of information that might make your life in uh, checkpoint two a little bit easier. So you'll note when you're implementing these operators that the uh, there's a lot of metadata that you're going to need to track of uh, or uh, when implementing the new operators. Uh, for example, if I'm computing an aggregate, I need to talk about work along with that aggregate. So I'm computing uh, a join. There might be some buffer here as well. Um, I might want to pre-compute the schemas uh, of expressions so I can evaluate uh, the schemas of relational operators so I can implement uh, expression evaluation much more efficiently. Um, now, now this, this, all of this metadata makes it very easy to implement uh, an evaluator, but uh, in checkpoint two, what you'll be doing is implementing an optimizer. Uh, you'll have to rewrite these these uh, relational algebra expressions online, and keeping track of all of this metadata is going to be a complete nightmare. So what I encourage you to do is to actually create a third layer. So you've got your SQL query, you've got your relational algebra expression. I encourage you to create a uh, middle layer that is also 
effectively relational algebra. For the purposes of this assignment, the translation from uh, this layer to the next is going to be completely brain dead. Um, but without all of the metadata that, you keep, that you'll find that you need uh, for evaluation purposes. Um, keeping this much simpler representation is going to be much e uh, make it much easier for you to implement uh, optimization with checkpoint two. Um, so I encourage you to, to do that. Uh, any questions on project one? Any questions on query evaluation? All right. Um, if any question, uh, is there a question there? All right. Um, I encourage you to uh, post any questions that do arise on Piazza. And uh, with that, thank you. And see you all on Wednesday.